It is so great to see many of you. I'm so appreciative of all of you this morning and always. It's a privilege to be able to serve alongside of you here in this location. When you open up your Bible, uh, it's on like page one or two of mine. You got to open and uh, all that, but you have uh, this table of contents. And when you look at that, the way it's arranged is not chronologically at all. I don't know if you're aware of that or not. Most of us don't use chronological Bibles. But you have Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Those are called the books of the law. Then you have uh, you know, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, First and Second Samuel, so on and so forth. These are called the books of history. And then you have uh, the, the poetic literature and the wisdom literature. Then you have what we call the major prophets and then the minor prophets. The major prophets are called major prophets not because they're more important than the minor prophets, but because of the length of the prophets. So uh, you have uh, Jeremiah, and you have Isaiah, and Ezekiel, and Daniel. Daniel's the shortest of those. Lamentations, of course, kind of goes along with Jeremiah. And then you have these minor prophets, which are shorter than the uh, major prophets. And the reason I mention all of that is because when you look at that category of the minor prophets, and you look at those names there, uh, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, I might ask you to tell me what sticks out amongst those, if there is any story that sticks out amongst those, if there's any information that sticks out amongst those more than any of the others. And if I were to have you look at that list and then give me that information, then it kind of gives it away, of course, because we're talking about Jonah. You would probably say Jonah, right? Jonah and the well, there you go, or the big fish. There's some argument, and uh, here's a tad bit of information about me. I obeyed the gospel. I started worshiping uh, and attending Churches of Christ when I was 16, and it was December of that year that I was uh, I was baptized. I obeyed the gospel, uh, and uh, I was really intrigued and interested in the you know the the methodology in the Churches of Christ beforehand. Not saying that I was always wrong and that other people are wrong. That's not what I'm saying at all. But beforehand, if you would have asked me what I believed, I would have said, well, let me go ask my preacher and I'll tell you what I believe then. What, what do we believe? What does our group believe about this subject? But when I started going to the Churches of Christ, what they did, and I'm not saying all Churches of Christ are this way and all other groups are the opposite way, but what they did was said, let's, let's look in the Bible. Let's just see what the Bible says. Let's open it up together and see what we need to do about living, about how we worship, about this, that, or the other. And I found that very intriguing. But here's the tidbit about me. Uh, the first sermon that I preached, I was 17 years old. I knew pretty much immediately that I wanted to be a preacher. Didn't realize all of the, the difficulty that goes along with that sometimes. The very best part of preaching is studying the Word and people. But the very worst part of uh, being a preacher sometimes can also be people. Some of you are difficult. I love you, but some of you are difficult. I'm difficult at times. I had a, somebody tell me once uh, that I was probably their best friend uh, because I was the most difficult. <laughs> you know, it was difficult to get along with me in some ways. Uh, they had to kind of work toward it. And some of that that you have to work toward kind of builds those relationships. But I knew pretty much immediately that I wanted to preach. And Jonah was the first sermon that I preached uh, whenever I was 17. And it's going to be far different than it was then. Uh, I've learned a lot since then. But we're going to open up and we're going to look at Jonah. Jonah and the whale. The, the whale makes the story kind of famous. But uh, if I calculated and counted correctly, there's only like two or three verses in the whole book that mentions the whale. The whale is really kind of a, a minor piece of this story. Jonah is the highlight of the story. And Jonah is so much different than the other minor prophets or the major prophets because you would open it up and remember what the biggest rule in study of the Bible, biblical interpretation, hermeneutics is, is context. Second biggest rule, context. Third biggest rule is context. And this is not just true for the Bible. It's true for anything. You go to a coffee shop and you overhear someone saying, I'm going to kill him. So you wonder, uh, 
do I need to call the authorities? <laughs> is this a, is there a, a, a murder being planned here that I'm going to kill this individual? Or they worry about all the toxic ingredients in our food, the seed oils, the fluoride, the chemtrails, and all these different things. I'm going to kill them if we keep living here or we keep eating this way. Maybe it's not a planning of a murder. Maybe it's just cause for concern. Maybe it's, uh, it's any of those things. So you look at context to see what's going on in this conversation to see if you need to be concerned or if this is someone who is concerned that what they're going to do. So interpretation of the Bible is the same as anything that you have to look at context. So you open it up and it says, the Lord's message came to Jonah, the son of Amittai. So uh, you wonder what type of literature this is. Here's what the authors of the Bible were trying to do and what they expected of us. They expected of us to read it and then read it in conjunction with all of the other things that were going on. So when you read it, you're supposed to be building these connections. So you open it up and you read it and you wonder, what is it that I'm about to read here? Because it sounds very similar to Micah. You just turn one page over and in Micah, this is the Lord's message that came to Micah. But Jonah and Micah are very different. Micah is the prophecy that he had. This is Micah's prophecy. This is Micah's word from the Lord. But Jonah is not that. Jonah is the story about the individual the word of the Lord came to. Do you see? So we get a glimpse into this individual. And last week, if you were here, we talked about Elijah. We talked about what it means to be a prophet. What does a prophet do? Because I consider us, in a lot of ways, all of us are prophets, you see? Now, we don't necessarily foretell the future, and that's not what all prophets did. We don't have a direct communication from God directly to Bob or directly to Eric or directly to Justin or directly to Randy or anyone else. There is no message that comes directly to me that I give to you. We have the word of the Lord that is in the Bible. But we're to share that word, aren't we? So in that way, we are prophets. Every one of us are prophets who are to share the word of the Lord. So we have this glimpse of what a prophet does in Ezekiel or in um, uh, Elijah last week. And then this week, what did this prophet do? So you have what we call types, that is, uh, individuals that you follow or that you see similarities to and in other individuals in the Bible. And Jonah's mentioned in the New Testament. Jesus says there's no sign that I'm going to give except for the sign of Jonah, that he was in the belly of the whale and the great fish for three days. And just like that, the Son of Man is going to be in the belly of the earth for three days and he's going to come out. The, spit, the, the fish spat him up, you see. And this is the exact same thing. So you have a type in that way. But here in Jonah, more than anything, you have this anti-type. Jonah, I'm not trying to be mean. It's easy to Monday morning quarterback things, right? And say, uh, looking at this game tape, this is what they should have done. This is what uh, Kamala should have done. This is what Trump should have done. This is what this team should have done. This is what Jonah should have done. And it's easy to do those things in hindsight. My dad always says, hindsight is 2020. So it's easy for us to do that, but I'm, I'm not saying this lightly. Jonah wasn't really a great guy, you know? Jonah, uh, you just look at the things that he does here, and he is given this message from God, and instead of going and delivering that message, he goes the opposite way. And then whenever he actually does deliver the message, he's mad that the message took heart. This is a preacher who is mad and sad and upset that people listen to his message. That is not normal, right? A preacher wants his message to be heard from and heard of. If there is something that I could uh, make you do or get you to do, if I could really get it to implant in your heart, you said that made a difference in my life, and I'm going to live this afternoon different than I did this morning. I'm going to do something different on Monday morning this week than I did on Monday morning last week. That would make me pleased as punch. That's what I want. I want to affect positive change in your life, but not only in your life, but in my life as well. Whenever I'm preaching these words, believe me when I say that I'm preaching it to me first. There's one finger pointed to you, but whenever those one finger, that one finger is pointing at you, the other three or four are pointing back at me, you see? So I'm not saying any of these things from a position of superiority that I'm right and you're wrong, you need to change and I don't need to change. This message is really convicting to me whenever I read about what Jonah did. So the, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Go immediately to Nineveh, that large capital city, and announce judgment against its people because their wickedness has come to my attention. Nineveh 
It was also a horrible place. Here's what the people of Nineveh did. And let me again remind you that the Old Testament isn't in chronological order. So next week, I think we're going to be at Isaiah. And Isaiah is before Jonah when you're reading in your Bible, all right? Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah. So why do we skip over to Jonah and then coming back to Isaiah? Because it's not in chronological order. You see, Isaiah was prophesying about Babylon coming to the southern kingdom. But Jonah was more in the northern kingdom, and he was preaching against Nineveh. The enemy of the northern kingdom of Israel was Nineveh, was Assyria. Nineveh was the capital city there. So that happened in about 722 B.C. So we think this happened maybe around 725 B.C. He says, go to your enemy, Nineveh. These people who, whenever they come in and they attack a place, they plunder it, and then the leaders, they skin alive. This, go to these horrible, wicked individuals and preach the word of the Lord to them, right? This, this is a story that is really kind of satire. You know what satire is? Satire is like Saturday Night Live where they're making fun of us, uh, but they're making us laugh. They're, they're showing us a picture of who we in America, who, who the world is, who we as individuals are, and they're making us laugh about it, but then it's also supposed to make us think at the same time. And that's even more the case here, because here what we have is the good person, Jonah, doing what's bad, running away from God. And we have the bad people, that is the, the, the sailors. Uh, we have a saying about sailors, right? Sailors are kind of rough around the edges. Uh, you do something like a sailor. What do you do like a sailor? Curse, right? Uh, always, uh, sailors are the are not the the most holiest of individuals, right? Uh, that you curse like a sailor. They're rough around the edges. These are are not the holiest of people. But what happens is uh, they're the first ones in our text to start praying. Jonah is the prophet of God, and they have to remind Jonah to pray. And they're casting all these prayers out to all these different gods. But at the end of Jonah chapter 1, they're the ones who give their dedication and their devotion to Yahweh. You see? The bad people are doing good things. Nineveh, and we're not going to get to that. I was a little confused. I was, I was struggling this week what I'm supposed to do. The text really, uh, if you see it on the screen, is chapter 1 and chapter 3. And it has in brackets that I could do chapter 4. It skips over chapter 2, which is this Hebrew poetry, which is really fascinating and interesting. There are so many messages that I could give from this. I could uh, condense it all into one if I could try, or I could try to uh, make many lessons of it. But I don't want to do that this morning. I was kind of confused. So instead of covering all that, we're going to pretty much just stick in chapter 1. Uh, but if we did read chapter 3 and we did get to chapter 4, what we would see is that the bad people, Nineveh, actually repent. The bad people who are the ones who skin people alive, they repent. Even the cows repent. But you see, it's, it's kind of supposed to be funny. It's, it's these bad people, even their livestock repent. Isn't it fascinating? So it's this satire. And what we're supposed to do is see ourselves in Jonah, right? The word of the Lord comes to Jonah. The word of the Lord comes to us. What did Jonah do? And uh, we judge Jonah, and then we say, how could you do that? But then we look a little closer and we say, well, maybe I do those things. Maybe I'm kind of like Jonah. Maybe the word of the Lord comes to me, and I do exactly what Jonah did. You see, I'm supposed to be this good person. I'm a church person. I go to church. I'm a Christian. I'm holy. I pray all the time. And I read my Bible all the time. And I say I love my neighbors. But do I really love my neighbors? Am I really delivering the message of the Lord? And this is what we're supposed to do. And we judge Jonah, but then we say, uh-oh, wait. Maybe I do that too. You see? Maybe we do those same things. Keep reading. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai. Jonah, by the way, means dove. So you get this idea that this innocent, this good individual, son of Amittai, uh, faithfulness, dove, the son of faithfulness, and you're like, oh, yeah, right. <laughs> when you read those things, he's not son, uh, dove, the son of faithfulness. What does he do? He gets this message, and instead, it says in verse 3, Jonah immediately headed off to Tarshish, to escape from the commission of the Lord, he traveled to Joppa and he found a merchant ship heading to Tarshish. So uh, you're supposed to go northeast over here. I guess that would be over here for you. You're supposed to go northeast over here, but instead you go all the way over here. 
Uh, Tarshish, we think, is uh, this place that may be in Spain, uh, which is right before you get to the open ocean. So it's the last port that he could go to. Instead of going over here, I'm going to get as far away from God's domain, which is the whole world, uh, but it's not just Israel. Uh, they had geographic, what they thought was geographic gods. God is the God of this area, uh, but really God is the God of the whole world. I'm going to go away from this area where God is as far away as I possibly can. You see, he goes to Tarshish, so he paid the fare. He went aboard it to go with them to Tarshish, far away from the Lord. Uh, one of the first messages that I said uh, whenever I was 17 was that, uh, you know, what he did was he paid the fare twice, right? What he did was he paid the fare to run away from God, and then he paid the consequences for it later. And this is what we do sometimes with our choices. I, you know, I'm not being critical. I know it's addictive. And I know some people don't even think it's really that bad. Uh, but when we go and we, we smoke cigarettes, we're paying for the cigarettes, and then we're going to pay for it later with the cost to our health. Do you see? Or we eat these bad foods because we say, oh, they're, they're cheaper, they're, uh, they're, they're easier for me to get, but then we pay later for it with our health. You see? So this is exactly what he did. He paid the fare... And then he paid the consequence. He paid it twice, right? But that's not really the point of God. My uh, point of what we see here, my question is for us, and I've got two for us today. Are you listening to me? He ran from God, but why? Why would he run from God? Now, there may be lots of reasons for him to do this. Maybe he was afraid. Uh, Nineveh, there are some awful people there. Again, they plunder, they skin alive. This is the enemy of the Jews. Maybe he thought there was some shame in saving his enemies, shame from his people. Oh, this is the guy who went to Nineveh and uh, caused them to repent because God is gracious and compassionate and merciful. Maybe it's loss of future income. Here's this guy who went over there. We don't want to hire him to be a prophet anymore. We don't want to support him to be a preacher anymore. He's trying to bring everybody in. We don't want those people. We only want the right people, right? Maybe that's why. I don't know. It doesn't say here. But it does say over in chapter 4 uh, why he said it was. He said in chapter 4, after Nineveh uh, repented, uh, Jonah was displeased uh, terribly, and he became very angry, and he prayed to the Lord, and he said, Oh, Lord, this is just what I thought would happen when I was in my own country. This is what I tried to prevent. This is why I ran. This is why I tried to prevent by attempting to escape to Tarshish, because I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in mercy, and one who relents concerning threatened judgment. God, I'm mad at you for being so good. <laughs> I don't want you to forgive them, so I'm not going to preach to them, you see? So he ran away from God, and this is a prophet from God. Uh, did he not know? And David had already wrote this. Psalm 139 is a psalm of David. Uh, did he not know Psalm 139? Where can I go to escape your spirit, verse 7? Where can I flee to escape your presence? If I were to ascend to heaven, you would be there. If I go to Tarshish, you'll be there, he could say. Did he not realize these things? Jesus all the time asked in the New Testament, haven't you read your Bibles? Don't you know what the Bible says? You're over here arguing this point, but you're not even considering what God said. You've got all these traditions and you've got all these different things that you're doing. And he said, I've just forgotten about Psalm 139. If I were to sprawl out with Sheol, that is in death, in the grave, there you would be, verse 9. If I were to fly away on the wings of the dawn in Psalm 139, verse 9, and settle down on the other side of the sea, even there your hand would guide me, your right hand would grab hold of me. If I were to say, certainly the darkness will cover me and the light will turn to night all around me, even the darkness is not too dark for you to see and the night is as bright as day. Darkness and light are the same to you. Uh, he, he knew he couldn't run, but he did anyway because he knew God's character. God is forgiving and I don't want these people forgiven. God, God uh, Jonah doesn't want them to be forgiven, you see? And here's the long and the short of it. Are you listening? Jonah, and this is where it hits home for us, where we're supposed to be thinking about this when we see about Jonah. Jonah had a plan for his life. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to go to Washington State, 
over there in the heart of Washington State to the apple capital of the world, and I'm going to convert all of these people, and I'm going to fill this place, and I'm going to do all of these different things, and people are going to love me, and people are going to th- say how great you are, and it's just going to be a wonderful place. We're going to cause revival there. This is the plan that you have. I- I'm going to uh, go here in Israel, and I'm going to preach the word, and I'm going to say what God wants me to say, but don't send me there. Don't do that, God. He had a plan for his life. Don't don't take too long to operate. Here we are, what, uh, almost 13 months in since I've been here, and it, maybe we're less in attendance than we were uh, you know, 13 months ago whenever I got here. That's not my plan. See, I have a plan for my life. You have a plan for your life. But what God does sometimes is he, he, he messes that up, and he works in a different way. I don't want it to work out that way. You see, why would I run from you? Because I have a plan for my life. I have a vision for my life. God, why can't you just uh, get some announcement, get some bullhorn from heaven, speak from God, speak from heaven itself, send an angel, send someone there uh, to just announce these things, do some miraculous things, and that will convert them in Nineveh. Do those same things here in Wenatchee. That'll convert Wenatchee. That'll get the people who aren't in church to be in church. That'll get the people who aren't in community to come into community. Jesus had something to say about that. Whenever Lazarus and the rich man were, uh, you know, uh, Lazarus was in Abraham's bosom, the rich man was in torment, was in Tartarus there, and uh, the rich man says, send Lazarus back from the grave to tell my brothers. And Jesus said, or the, uh, God said, Abraham said in this case, uh, to, that if he has Moses and the prophets, if they won't listen to him, then they won't listen even if someone comes back from the grave. Could God do something different? Could God uh, make it just completely irrefutable that God is speaking and doing something in your life? Of course he could. But here's the thing. Apart from a few circumstances, he rarely, if ever, does that. Yes, he did uh, go up against the gods of Egypt and he defeated them in the ten plagues. Yes, he did, but working through Moses, part the Red Sea. Yes, he did, but working through Joshua and the people there in Israel, he did defeat the Canaanites. He did do those things, but most of the time, what God did in the Bible even was work through people. Go and take this message, you see? And here's the thing. He had his vision for life. He thought he was running for his life to something that was more important, but he was running away from his life. Here's what children do. I, I've got a few little children. Many of you have had uh, children in your home or in your life or other people that you've been in charge of. And you have uh, you know, different knowledge and expertise. You have different life experiences. And you say, stay away from that. That's bad. Don't waste those things. We just spent $600 at the grocery store in order to, uh, you know, uh, to, to buy this food. We can't, we can't just waste our food. We can't do those things. You need to, you know, to do this or do that or whatever it is. And what the children do sometimes is do just the opposite because they have their vision for life. And what you're doing is getting in the way of that vision. That thing over there on the opposite side of the street looks so intriguing. That little dump truck or that big dump truck or, or that uh, shiny rock or whatever it is. But here is a street between you and it and they want to go running toward it and you're, you're just being this fun sucker that's stopping them from getting to where they're supposed to be and where they want to be. But what you're really doing is saving them from traffic going back and forth and running their little bodies over. Do you see? So we're running away from God because God has a vision for our life and we have a vision for our life and we say this is what's best for us, this money in my IRA, this uh, money in my bank, uh, this this time that I have, this time is mine and I think it'd be better spent not being in church or not serving with the church here or not praying or whatever else it is. I only have so much. Time is fleeting. It's better spent over here doing this but God says no. Real life and real fulfillment is over here in doing these things. He's not trying to take away our son, our fun. God is not some kind of cosmic joy kill that he's trying to keep you from doing things that are fun. Sex and drugs and alcohol or whatever else it may be. He's not trying to keep you from those things uh, in order to keep you from fun. He's trying to keep you from those things because that's not real fun. That's not real good. That's not real fulfillment. Real fulfillment is in service and love and devotion and family and community in Christ. Do you see? That's what he's saying here. I I really love this statement from C.S. Lewis. I think it's in the 
book called The Weight of Glory and Other Addresses. Here's what he says, and I'm reading it verbatim. It would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because we cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. You see, these things over here, they, they may please us. They may, we may think they're good. Uh, one of my favorite quotes is uh, from Jim Carrey about, and here's just a paraphrase of it, is saying, I wish that everyone uh, could get uh, wealthy and famous and uh, have all their, their desires fulfilled in those ways because then they'll realize that's not the answer. Here's someone who has been famous. Here's someone who has rubbed elbows with other famous people. Here's someone who has more money in the bank than all of us combined. You see? And he says, there is not fulfillment in those things. It's never enough. You see? Never. And I, I'm just like you. I, I want to have money in the bank. And I want to see uh, 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 my, my portfolio raise in value. I liked it when Bitcoin went to $80,000 this morning. I like those things. You know? That's what I like. But that is not where true pleasure and enjoyment is. It's not in money and it's not in things. It's not even in your own family with seeing your children grow up. Oh boy, that brings a lot of pleasure. But what about seeing them grow up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord and seeing them follow Jesus and giving their life to Jesus? What about knowing that when this short life is over, 60, 70, 80 years, whenever all these things that we have here is over, that we have eternity in the household of God. I have gone to prepare a place for you that where I may be, you may be also. In my Father's house are many mansions or many rooms in my place. And I am going to prepare a place for you that we can be there, that wherever I am, you can be there with me. That's true fulfillment with the creator of the universe, the one who made you. You see, and we're over here just making mud pies, rolling around in the dirt, thinking that's all great. But there's a castle right over there where we can have everything that's even that's the most pleasurable thing that you can think of. And we were told that over there belongs to you, but we can't even fathom that. And that's what Jesus is telling us that we have this we have this vision for ourselves. Jonah had this vision for himself, but God says that's not the true vision for you. And it's not always stopping bad behaviors. Maybe you've already stopped those things. Sometimes it's starting good behaviors. Sometimes it's doing the thing that needs to be done because as frustrating as it can be, as it is, whenever people don't listen and people don't give their lives to God and people don't get committed and people don't want to listen to those things, you're still doing the work of the Lord. And Paul says, be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord because you know that your work in the Lord is not in vain, that it's coming back to you. You're putting way more money in your retirement account by serving God and even failing sometimes than you are by investing in uh, micro strategies or whatever else it may be. You see? Why run from God? But keep reading. Verse 4. After he ran away from the Lord, the Lord hurled a powerful wind, verse 4, on the sea. Such a violent tempest arose on the sea that the ship threatened to break up. And this is kind of, uh, you know, cartoonish, uh, apparently, in the, the Hebrew, uh, that the ship, you know, thought about breaking up. <laughs> so, again, it's this satire. It was so bad that the ship thought, maybe I should break up. Maybe I should just destroy myself. It's almost like a comic book here, Right? It threatened to break up. The sailors were so afraid that each cried out to his own God and they flung the ship's cargo overboard to make the ship lighter. Jonah, meanwhile, had gone down into the hole below the deck, had lain down and was sound asleep. The, the ship's captain approached him and said, what are you doing asleep? He's running from God. This huge storm comes up, right? And it's threatening to break up the ship. And what they're doing is calling out to all their gods in verse, what, five it is? They, they, they threw everything off the board, they, off, the, off the ship. They, they're, they're saying all these prayers to all these other gods. And Jonah's just down there asleep. The, the second question that I think uh, that Jonah is asking us, or the story of Jonah is asking us to consider is, are you asleep at the wheel? Have you ever heard of something called hypnotic driving? In, uh, in Kentucky, 
I had to drive uh, like 40 minutes when I worked at Chick-fil-A and, uh, you know, I do that five or six times a week, whatever. And, uh, in at Walmart, you know, 35 minutes and four days a week. And whenever I did that, uh, I would, you know, I would drive and then I would be listening to my music, podcast, whatever, you know, what you do in the car, you know, thinking about life. Hmm, what about this? What about that argument I had with my wife this morning? What about when I yelled at the kids earlier this morning when they probably deserved it, but should I have yelled at my kids uh, whenever you're praying, whatever it is that you're doing there? And you look up and you're like, how did I get to mile marker, uh, you know, five? How did this happen? Huh? How, how did I get here to this place? Because you're just driving and you just, it's just second nature. Your brain just does it. You do it so often that you just, you know, you're asleep, right? It can be disconcerting. How did I get here? How did this time pass? I've just been enjoying this music. I've just been enjoying this podcast. I've just been dwelling on whatever it is. And this, this is what's happening to Jonah. But he's asleep at the wheel whenever he's running from God. You see? He's asleep. No one else was asleep. And here's, here's the thing. Uh, Jonah was a prophet of God and causing these things, Right? I mean, this wouldn't, these were experienced sailors, all right? These were people who had done this many times in the past, and you can look at the weather and see, oh, storms are brewing, maybe we should pull to the sea, uh, oh, or pull to the shore, uh, oh, the storms are brewing, uh, we might need to wait just a little while for, uh, for this trip that we're about to make. Uh, and, you know, they didn't see any of that, it just came up all of a sudden, you see? And what happened was, Jonah, who caused all these things, was causing distress for those around us. For those around him. And here's what happens with Christians so often. Uh, Christians will go live in their life. They're in their monastery. They're in their little world. They're in their house. And they'll think about themselves when all the world is going to hell all around them. When everything else is just going wrong. And they won't even consider those things. I'm focused on studying the Bible. I'm focusing on prayer. I'm fo and I'm not saying those things are bad. In fact, I have emphasized those things. I want us to do those things. If you're not studying the Bible at home, please start. This is not enough of what I'm trying to feed you a little bit on Sunday morning. Please start doing it. And I want you to pray. Please pray every day. God, grow our faith in number. Let us serve Wenatchee in the world. Send us workers. Pray that God's will will be done. Pray that God will guide you and lead you. Pray that you can hate what God hates and love what God loves and that he'll direct you where you need to go. I want you to be praying. Those things are good, but we also get out there and we use our hands and our feet and we use our bodies to serve God. How can I serve my neighbor? How can I serve my country? I mentioned it just very briefly last week uh, but uh, about elections and that's just what's on our mind. It's kind of waning a little bit already and that's great. I, I want that off our mind. I'm tired of looking at it. Sickening. I'm frustrated that uh, we had to put up with all of these name calling and all this policy for months and months and months. But you know one of the biggest voting blocks in the United States of America? Christians. But most Christians don't utilize that. Because we're in our own little world here. You see? They're, they're doing all of these things. God had called Jonah, but he was asleep. Not because he was afraid, but because he thought he knew better than God. He had a different vision for his life. But they wake him up. Again, in verse 6, uh, get up, cry out to your God. Perhaps your God might take notice of us so that we might not die. The sailors said to one another, come on, let's cast lots to find out whose fault it is that this disaster has overtaken us. So they cast lots and Jonah was singled out. And they said to him, tell us whose fault it is that this disaster has overtaken us. What's your occupation? What, what do you do for work? Uh, where, where do you come from? What's your country? And who are your people? He said to them, I'm a Hebrew and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. I fear the Lord. That's really what it says there. I fear the Lord. But here's the irony again. He says that he fears the Lord, but does he? Does he? He doesn't. Hearing this, I worship the Lord in verse 9, at the end of verse 9. I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. We're sending out all these different prayers everywhere else, but you're telling us you serve the God who made the sea? <laughs> no wonder this happened. He has control over the sea, and you did this? Verse 10, hearing this, the men became even more afraid and said to him, what have you done? The men said this because they knew that he was trying to escape from the Lord because he had previously told them, hey, could I get fair with you? Where are you going? Uh, Tarshish. That's perfect. I want to go to Tarshish. Well, what's your, what are you doing there? Business or pleasure? Well, I'm running away from my God. <laughs> and uh, this would seem, this is actually pretty normal, right? Because it's geographical gods. I'm trying to get away from them, 
right? And this is what they said. They didn't know which God it was. And they didn't know uh, how powerful he was. They didn't know what this God was all was in charge of. You're trying to run away from your God who made the sea? How, how does that make, make any sense? And you're getting on a boat? So they're afraid. They're afraid of these things. Uh, what should we do? They, because the storm, verse 11, was growing worse and worse, they said to him, what should we do to you so that we, the sea will calm down for us? He said to them, pick me up and throw me into the sea so the sea will calm down for you because I know it's my fault uh, that you are in this severe storm. They say, he said, throw me over. And there's some debate about this. Is he trying to rescue them? I don't think so. Is he trying to rescue them? Or is he trying to get away from God? What's the, what's the best way to get away from your troubles? Well, deal with them. All right. But there are people and I hope maybe you haven't had to deal with this. If you have, I'm so sorry because it's just such a horrible situation. I've dealt with families that had to deal with this. But the people who commit suicide, you know what what they're doing that for? They've got such severe pain in their life, whether it's physical or emotional or whatever kind of pain. They've got this pain in their life and they feel like the only escape from their pain is to die. And they're not considering the people around them and how much pain that might cause for them. But they they want to escape that pain. So he says, I want to escape God. What's the best way to escape God? Dying. You see? And I think that's what it is. He's still trying to escape God. But instead, verse 13, they tried to row back to land. They said, no, we're not going to kill you. You serve Yahweh. We're not going to kill you. We're not going to do this. But they were not able to do so because the storm kept growing worse and worse. So they cried out to the Lord, oh, please, Lord, don't let us die on account of this man. Don't hold us guilty of shedding innocent blood. After all, innocence, right? Duh. Jonah, the son of Amittai, uh, son of faithfulness. Don't, don't let us die or be guilty of shedding innocent blood. After all, Lord, you have done just as you please. So they picked Jonah up and they threw him into the sea and the sea stopped raging. The men feared the Lord greatly. Jonah says, I fear the Lord, but who actually feared the Lord? The sailors. Do you see? And the, the message is for us that even in uh, when we fail to do what's right, when we fail to do those things, when we ignore the pleas and the plights of those individuals around us that are struggling, sometimes God can still use us to affect positive change, right? Even people who are rough around the edges, these individuals feared the Lord greatly and earnestly vowed to offer lavish sacrifices to the Lord. And the Lord sent a huge fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the stomach of the fish for three days and three nights. And then in chapter two, which is supposed to be, again, kind of funny, because here he is in the belly of the fish. And what's he doing here in chapter two? He's writing Hebrew poetry. I know that's what I do whenever I'm struggling. I think about writing poetry. Roses are red, violets are blue. I'm in pain and so are you. I just made that up right now. I didn't have that in my notes. Isn't that beautiful? You know, uh, that's, that's not what I do whenever I'm in pain. And it's supposed to be funny because here he is in the belly of the whale, or the belly of the great fish, and he's writing Hebrew poetry. It's supposed to be uh, um, uh, farcical. It's supposed to be satire. It's supposed to be funny. You see? The sailors wake Jonah up and they cry out to the Lord. This again, and I know I've already mentioned it very briefly, but this is the first prayer in the book from non-believers. They pray to Yahweh. They they actually fear Yahweh. When Jonah says he does, the sailors actually do. But the, the question is, are you asleep at the wheel? Are you asleep while you're supposed to be doing the things that God has told you to do? And the second question that's connected to that, third question, I guess, but the second question that's connected to that is, what what does what does Jonah wakes up in chapter two and he he repents in chapter three he goes and does those things and he makes a difference he does what God wanted him to do now, interestingly enough the same message came to Jonah the same message that was the, the words don't change at all go to Nineveh that great city and cry out against it forty days and Nineveh shall be destroyed the shortest sermon ever that's what you wish for sometimes isn't it it's okay. And they obey. He wakes up. But the question is, what does Jonah do to wake up spiritually? And this is important to me because I need to be woken up spiritually from time to time, often. Maybe you need to be woken up. I want our, our community to be woken up. Here we are in this, this location, and there are 
I imagine, uh, hundreds of people within a half mile radius of us that don't go to church anywhere. That don't have any, com- any, any commitment to God whatsoever. How can we reach those people? Hmm? The people uh, that aren't half a mile around us, the people that are connected to you, the people you work with, the people in your family, the people that may be even living in your own home. How can you connect them? I think about this uh, for being a parent. How can I help my children? How can I connect them to God and I pray with them and I, I, I read the Bible to them just about every day? I do these things. And I'm not saying I have to lift myself up. I'm saying that because I'm desperate and I want to wake them up and I worry sometimes. And here's, uh, you know, uh, Benjamin's in the room. And a few years ago, I was worried to death about Benjamin. I'm like, oh man, uh, he's 13 now. And, uh, you know, a few years ago when he was nine, he was, uh, you know, a big pill. You know, he's only a little pill now. Now sometimes, Benjamin, uh, you know, uh, I had to wake him up. I got him all ready this morning and, uh, you know, then he went back downstairs and he fell back asleep and I call for him and he doesn't come. I'm like, we got to go now. You know, this is not time to go. And he doesn't come. And then I'm shouting at the top of my lungs so I don't have to go down there. Ben! And then he gets up and he's like, what? What? He fell back asleep, I guess. What? You know, 13 year old, right? Am I right? Am I right? Anyway, he's like, what? What? And then uh, he, uh, he starts walking up the stairs and he uh, like, turn the lights off down there first. I got that from my parents. You always have to turn the lights off. You know, uh, like you got it, electricity is cheap here, but you got to turn the lights off. And, uh, you know, uh, my my parents, you know, like uh, shouted at me, turn the lights off, you know, close the refrigerator. You're letting that air out. Uh, close the door. You're letting the bot air out. And, you know, all that kind of stuff. You know what parents do. We turn into our parents. Right. And I said, turn the lights out down there. And he starts stepping up the stairs and then he falls. Uh, and I'm like, oh, oh, and I'm like, yeah, he's fine. And Rose's like, are you okay? Are you okay? Moms and dads, am I right? Anyway, uh, this is what happens. I was worried to death about him a few years ago, but, you know, he's starting to get it uh, at 13, right? So, you know, whenever Rue and I have our talks all the time about, you know, what about this? You know, I'm just, oh, man, this is so hard. This is frustrating. You know, both of us working outside the home. This is pretty hard uh, and having littles at home. It's kind of tough. I don't know if you've been there, uh, you know, in the same way. It's a different world than it was 30 years ago, 40, 50 years ago. Uh, You know, it is a different world. Uh, I know you might have gone through some of these things, but it's tough. And, you know, I'm like, just wait and see is what I always say. Just let's see what God does. Just wait and see. It's what I always say. She almost knows it. And she asked me, what do you think about this? I'm like, what do I usually say? It's like, wait and see. So, you know, anyway, this is what we do. But, you know, I want to wake them up. What what does he do? What does Jonah do to wake up? Do you see? He doesn't do anything. He doesn't do anything. So this is some encouragement for me, you know, in the whole wait and see thing. He doesn't do anything. Something is done to him. Something is done to him. So, uh, you know, what, what do we do? I can't tell you how to wake up spiritually. Again, I'm, I'm talking to myself here. I don't really feel, uh, I don't really feel uh, equipped and in the right position to tell you, uh, many of you who have years and years more experience, some of you may even know the Bible better than I do. I don't know, and that's fine. I, I don't feel appropriate telling you what to do because I need to know myself. But the answer is right here in the text. The Lord sent a huge fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the stomach of the fish three days and three nights, and then he turns around. What we do, what we do is simply this. We carry on. We look for opportunities to serve God. And please listen. We pray. We pray. Uh, Yes, you know, I'm... Maybe I criticized prayer a few minutes ago. I didn't mean to do that. I'm just saying that there's other things to do and you're doing those things. You're looking for what you can do, right? Don't be like Jonah and run away from God. Don't be like Jonah and asleep at the wheel. You look for the opportunities to serve God. But in the meantime, you wait for God and you wait through prayer. And that's what we're trying to do here. That's what I say every week. And and it's not a broken record. It's because I, it's so important, it's so important to, to give God some time in prayer every single day for your family, for our community, for our church here, if you want it to keep staying here. There's other churches in our community. Uh, there's people who uh, fear God in our community. I'm not saying that we're the only ones, that we're this bastion of hope 
in, uh, in Wenatchee that we're the only way. Please don't hear that. What I am saying is that there have been a lot of people impacted and influenced through this church, and I want it to continue. I want that desperately, and I pray for it every day, and sometimes I struggle. Is that going to happen? Maybe you're there too. Maybe you're there too, and that's okay to feel that way. But you don't, you don't surrender to those base feelings of just giving up in that way. You give it, instead of up, you give it up to God. You see? And that's what we're going to do today. Let's stand and say our prayer. We put it up for me? Remain standing for the song afterward. God, grow our faith in number. Let us serve Wenatchee in the world. Send us workers. You're